how it worked back then. <laughs> <laughs> Two guys, the guys being uh, uh, Ray Liotta and, and Joe Pesci, Tommy went away in the truck. The driver goes into the diner, and you know, it's a different time, and says to the guy behind the counter, you got a phone? <laughs> Come on, you got a phone? The guy goes, yeah. He goes, can you believe this? Two N-words just stole my truck. Right. <laughs> Okay, the movie is good, fellas. Hey, let me tell you something. I got the character. You know what I'm saying? I'm doing the whole thing here. The Polish Madman. The great Bob Golub. Bob Golub's got one of the greatest stories I've ever heard. One of the greatest stories I've ever heard in show business. I was a pretty big drug dealer. I sold a lot of drugs. I sold a lot of pot. So I go in. I think this is my one shot. I got a 9mm pistol. It's loaded. I got 2,000 cash. I got the pinky ring. I got the jacket on, the hair slicked back. Yeah. And I got handcuffs. That's right, the Polish madman. What's up out there? Hey, man, listen, this is uh, Bob Gollop. I know a lot of people might not know who I am. I really don't give a fuck. But I've been doing stand-up comic uh, for many, many years and an actor. Uh, I guess what I'm really known for is being in Martin Scorsese's classic film, Goodfellas. And I had a little part in that, but I've been doing stand-up for many years. I mean, check this out, dude. I mean, I've literally done friggin' prisons. I did Rawway State Prison in New Jersey. I did Western Penitentiary. I've done major casinos. I've just been around doing this forever. You give me a spot, I've been it, I've done it, I've been there. But what I want to talk about today is I can't get into fucking Canada. Now, check this out. Anyone that's from Canada would know that for some reason, even if you have like a DWI under five years, you can't get into Canada. So here's what happened. I think it was like, now the date I could be off a little bit, but it was like, like 1993 or something. I was going to do a gig in Canada. And, uh, you know, when you're going uh, through customs, they ask you, have you ever been in trouble or, you know, had a, arrested or anything like that? And like an asshole, I said, oh, yeah, I, I, was, I was in prison in 1978 to 79 for cells in possession of controlled substance. Oh, holy shit. I thought I was a terrorist or something. The lights went off. They pulled me uh, to the side. And they said that you're not allowed in Canada. And I said, dude, I'm going to do a gig here, you know. So the long story short is sometimes I always say, you know, be truthful, but that's bullshit. Sometimes the truth doesn't set you free. The truth fucks you up. I should have just said no. And if they checked, I'd go, well, I thought it was resolved, you know. But no, like an asshole, I said, I told the truth. And so they said I wasn't allowed in Canada. Well, here I am stuck at the fucking airport. And... Until they called the club. I, rem I don't remember the name of the club now. It's in Montreal. So they let me go in. And they said, the next time you come in, you have to go to the consulate and get what they call an application for criminal rehabilitation. Anyways, so I go back in. Uh, just so you know, I've actually been to the White House. I've been to the friggin' White House in America. I met Reagan uh, I gave him one of my lucky potatoes, which is another thing I used to do. And I sold raw lucky potatoes, believe it or not. Anyways, so I've been to the fucking White House, okay? I've been everywhere, but I can't get into Canada. So I go back again now. It's maybe, I don't know, two, three years after the first time. And I forgot all about it, you know? My mom had just passed, my mother. It was like a week after that. So I was like in that mode, you know, losing your mother. And I just didn't even think. I was doing the Montreal Comedy Festival. And I go back in. And I don't know why. I must have that look. I, you know, I, I have that look, I guess. I, I used to ask a girl for a number. She'd go 911. I don't know. I, I look like a, I don't know. But they pulled me out of the line. And uh, they check they check my ID, and it comes up obviously, uh, you know, um, that I was, you know, they ran that bullshit through before, and they, they, you know, they said, did you get clearance? You know, you don't show clearance here. And I, now, here's the weird thing about this: I was in my hometown in Sharon, Pennsylvania, by Youngstown, Ohio, where I grew up. Right, I was visiting, and I was literally going from there to Montreal Comedy Festival. Well, 
for some reason, uh, they pulled me, when they, when they pulled me off the line, they actually took me into this interrogation place. So I'm sitting at this bench, and there, there's like a desk up there, kind of like a, a police department, you know. And the one uh, officer there had went in the back to, I guess, call Montreal Comedy Festival. <clears throat> so anyways... I'm just sitting there, so I look at my comedy notes. I pull out my comedy book, and this little marijuana bud had fell out of my bag. And I have no idea where it came from. I mean, it scared the shit out of me because, my God, I mean, if they, you know, find that, I'm going to jail. I'm going to, you know, they're going to arrest me and probably maybe prosecute me. I have no idea, but I have no idea where it came from. I swear to God. So it's, it wasn't a big bud. It was just a very small bud. So what I did, I stepped on it with my foot because this floor was like clean. I mean, you could, you could see your reflection. The floor was so clean. This would have stuck out. So I step on it, and I, the guy comes back, at the, uh, and he said, I come on back. They, like, they, he told me to follow him to this back room. So we past the desk and I'm dragging my foot the best I can with this little bud of marijuana and he starts interrogating me well uh, what was your actual charge I said well it was in 78 uh, at this time I don't know it was like 97 96 so it's been like you know how many years many years you know and I'd never been in trouble since then so but I told him it was for cell possession of a controlled substance. And he said, what was it? And I said, cocaine. But I wasn't a cocaine dealer. I was an actual pot dealer. I used to sell a lot of pot. I, had a, I was at a huge business when I was 19 years old. I'd walk around with long hair, trench coat, with a 9 millimeter pistol, a German Luger. Uh, drove a shitty car, $200 car with a $1,500 stereo system in it. You know, So I was a pot dealer. So I quit selling pot. But... Um, and I left my town and came back. Anyways, so this guy calls me up and says, he wants a gram of cocaine. And I figure, well, you know, I don't sell cocaine, but I figure I'll get him some, I'll cut it, and now I have something to get high with, you know. And uh, he calls me back up again. I know the guy. I went to school with him, you know. And he just come home from the military, so I figure, you know, he wants some. So he said, do you have another, uh, get another gram? He calls me up for another gram. I'm figuring... Okay, but I've stepped on this shit pretty heavy. I mean, I you know, cut it. I'm like, okay, he wants this shit again. Fine. Um, then he calls me up for a qu- for a quarter ounce of cocaine. Now, my suspicions come up because he also just bought two grams of really bad cocaine, which again I went and got from somebody else, and I was just if I could get high, I was using it at that time. Uh, anyways, so when he asked for a quarter, I'm figuring, wait a second. Something's not up. Either this guy is a fucking idiot, you know, and he doesn't know good cocaine, or he's a cop. And uh, he was a cop. So when I went to meet him that third time, I didn't take anything with me because I didn't have anything. And uh, I see him light a cigarette, bang, and I'm busted. So I don't explain all this to this guy, but I told him, you know, this, this scenario that I was, uh, I got in trouble, and I, I went to prison, I paid my de- debt, and uh, he said, it doesn't matter. You know, you're, you're inadmissible. You cannot come into Canada. And I said, and I said, look to the guy. I, I actually played it to my, and I could feel my heart pumping now because I know that that little bit of pot that came out of my, my, my briefcase, you know, where I had my comedy notes, wasn't mine. I had no friggin' idea, but I'm trying to talk to this guy and keep as calm as I could, you know. So, you know, he's asking me this stuff. And then I said, look, I've never been in trouble since then. Um, I wasn't, I wouldn't use my mother to get it, help get in. But I did say, you know, look, my mother just died. I, I didn't realize, I really apologize. Um, uh, I will go to the consulate and get this straightened out next, I mean, I, I, you know. So, anyways, long story short, they had got a hold of the people that had it. Mom, uh, Montreal Comedy Festival, the people to run it, and they said, yes, he's working here, so they let me come in with the restrictions that I couldn't go or do anything else except perform and leave. I said, that's no problem. That's why I was coming there. So 
you know, after about 45 minutes of him talking and asking me all these questions, my heart beating out of my chest, not knowing what the hell this little bit of plot was. I mean, just so they let me in. They said, okay, yeah, but you got to go to the consulate and get what they call a criminal rehabilitation. You have to go and get all this handled. I said, okay, no problem. So I get a cab and I go to the hotel. Now I'm calmed down now, like, oh my God, I got in. And I get back to my room, I take my clothes out, and, and then I, I pull my notes out to, again and everything on my, uh, my briefcase to go over my notes you know, for my set that uh, night. And out pops this bigger bud, a pot, which is like about two joints. And the first thing I'm thinking, my God, I can't fucking believe this. Like, where the fuck? And then my second thought is, I could get fucking high. This is great. I could get a fuck. I could smoke a bone, a couple bones. I found out later it was my brother Donnie. My brother Donnie was hiding a bag of pot from his son, so he had stuck it in my um, my comedy briefcase, you know, where I had my notes and stuff and other stuff. And he had, when he went to pull it out, some must have fell in. So, anyways, I told him, "You fucker, you almost I could have got me in prison for that shit." So I'm not allowed in Canada. So now what I got to do, this is fucked up, okay? I mean, I've developed and produced the first stand-up comedy show for the deaf and hard of hearing and hearing people in New York for 20 years. I raised, you know, a couple million dollars. You know, I've had everyone from Chris Rock to Bill Maher to Robert Klein to every you know, cat skills on Broadway, you know. So I've done my time. I've, I'm a father now with three kids. I, I'm a, a pillar of my community. So now I got to go through this fucking, app, I have to fill out now this application for uh, criminal rehabilitation. So that's my first step. Then now I got to go and send a thing to uh, FBI. My I just got fingerprinted. And I found out that report came back. That's the first step that you got to get. And then you got to get a three letters of recommendation. I was going to get one from a guy who's been in the military for about 42 years, a congressman I know. And I was thinking maybe the mayor of Toronto might be a good recommendation, you know. Meanwhile, I just wonder if that fucking guy, who, how, how stupid can you be? There was Marion Barry, who was a uh, mayor from D.C., a black uh, mayor who got caught smoking crack. But that was actually in a hotel. This guy is buying crack from a crack house. I mean, can you imagine? I was like, is that the fucking mayor? Yeah. What the fuck? You sure this is not a setup? I mean, you know. But the guy's actually buying crack from a crack house. I mean, you know, whatever. But I can't get into Canada in the meantime. You know, meanwhile, they'll let every fucking Arab come in from all these countries. Nothing against the Arabs. Fuck the Arabs, all right? Not, nothing against anyone. I don't give a fuck. I'm just saying from these, like, Yemen and shit like that, they'll let come in Canada. But I have a gig. I'm working. I can't see the name where I was working, but I was supposed to just fly into... Um, Vancouver recently and then go right in and go uh, to this gig offshore. I wasn't even going to be in Canada. I was going to take a fucking cab from the airport to where I was working. I can't, I don't want to mention the name. So, you know, this is fucked up. I mean, you know, I mean, so now I got to, so I get the, uh, the FBI report back and I, the only thing I can see is they do have those charges because you can't get it expunged where I grow up. They just won't fucking do it unless you get it the, the governor a Pennsylvania to do it, and I'm already on his shit about some other stuff. I've been talking to them, but anyways, so I gotta get, I gotta get the three letters of recommendation. It was no big deal. I mean, I, you know, I get that. That's no problem. I can get it from anybody. Um, and then you gotta write why. You know, I mean, it's just a fucking hassle, dude. I mean, like you have no idea of all the shit that you have to do. And I'm thinking, like, seriously. I mean, honestly. I'm wondering if the mayor of Toronto left Canada, would he be allowed to get back in? I have no idea, you know? So the things you got to get here, let me just see some of the stuff that's here. It's, this is unbelievable. The stuff that you have to supply to them. Besides, oh, so you got to get it. So, oh, anyways, I found out that in 1982, I was in Tucson. I forgot all about it. And I got in a fight, and, you know, I was in pretty good shape. I used to fight. I used to box. And I, I fucked this guy up pretty bad. I mean, but you know, I, I forgot all about it. You know what I mean? And so I think I broke his eye socket or something. I don't know. But he fucking, you know, pressed charges, you know, like, and then 
I don't know, I, I guess they reduced the simple assault. Uh, and I wasn't even fucking there. I mean, I forgot all about it. He was at a bar, we were drinking, and bing, bang, you know, we, next thing I know, we're fighting. And, uh, you know, I was living, a, you know, and I fucked him up. I mean, and then he filed some charges on me, and that, that was on my fucking FBI report. So now I got to go to Tucson, which I sent them, and they sent me a letter back and saying it was reduced. You know, so, I mean, dude, so now I, I got that. And I'm going to get that cleared up. And, you know, so now I got to fucking get all this other shit. I don't know where it's all at. Somewhere here. I'm at my table right now. Oh, yeah, I got I got the letters from a, my, you got to show the letters, what the exact charge was. And, you know, and then you put all this package together. And then you send them a couple hundred dollars. Well, you know, and they look at it and they approve and let you come in or not. That's what I'm doing. By the way, when I was in Tucson, Arizona, incidentally, I was working at the time. I was a horrible fucking comic, dude. I mean, like the first four years, I sucked fucking dick. I was the worst. But, you know, uh, anyways, so like I'm two years in a comedy, and I'm, I got met this guy, and, and he opened a comedy club called a Comedy Boat in Tucson, Arizona. He was partners with Murray Langston, who was the unknown comic, and he was hot at the time, you know. Uh, so they brought a lot of people. It was cool. I worked with uh, Red Fox and all these people. And I emceed the show. But I was fucking horrible, you know. But I, uh, I was lived there for six months. But I'll tell you what happened. Uh, the weirdest thing was uh, I had one good set. I had finally a good set. And it was a packed place. And it looked like a boat. Uh, and they turned it into a comedy club. Anyways, so I, I was there and these two girls I met they were hot, you know, and uh, they wanted to go on parties. So this is cool, you know. And there was this guy there. We were talking earlier, you know, and uh, I said, I go up to him and said, dude, you know, because I think I'm with two girls, you know, maybe I'll grab this dude and we'll go and, uh, you know, see if we can hit, you know, get some pussy, you know what I'm saying? So what happened was I go to the guy I said, dude, uh, hey, man, um, hey, you want to come with me? I got these two girls. He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, they're hot. Let's go. So we go outside, and I look in the car, in the back of his, his car is a guy sleeping. I go, no, what, fuck this, man. I'll, I'll, I'm good. I'll go by myself. I figured I got a better shot with the two girls, maybe hitting one of those, you know, or maybe hitting them both, who knows, than having three guys. Because the guy was waking up, and we, you know, he said, you know, when he went in the car. I said, no, nah, forget it, man. No, nah, I'm good. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just, they're going to follow me, and I'll be it, right? So next thing I know, he goes, no, no, man. No, 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 come on, dude, I want to go with this. I said, nah, nah, we, we didn't say dude back then, but I said, no, 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 forget about it. You're drunk, you're drunk as shit, all right, so forget it. So I'm driving, these girls are following me, and then I see this guy following us. Now, this is not the guy I got in a fight with. This is another situation. Uh, there's a lot of situations in my life. So... um I pull over. The girls pull over. They pull over. And I tell these guys, I said, look, man, and I'm telling you, okay, right now, leave me the fuck alone, all right? I'm taking these girls. And they go, oh, man, come on. I'm going with you. I said, no. I said, you're all fucked up, dude. You're drunk as shit. You're going to get pulled over by the police. You're going to go to jail for DWI. You should just get a coffee. Go somewhere. He goes, oh, man, don't worry about all the uh, cops. My, great, uh, my grandfather, they're like, uh, he got some lieutenants. Here, they could take care of that. And I said, well, what, I don't, what are you talking about? Well, he goes, I'm, I'm a Bonanno. Now, I, at the time, didn't live in New York. I didn't know who the Bonanos was. They're a crime family. I had no idea who they were. Big mob guy. Had, uh, the f grandfather's grandfather was in, lived in Tucson at the time. So I said, look, I don't give a fuck if you're Bonanno Banana, because, again, I don't know who he is. Or who bananas are? I said I don't care. Banana, banana. I don't give a fuck. Um, just leave me alone. So the guy uh, eventually uh, was getting a little huffy and puffy, you know, and like sticking his chest. I said, "Dude, listen to me, okay? It's not happening. All right. So get the fuck out of here." Well, one thing led to another. We started getting an argument over this, and it turned into a fight. And now it's him and his friend. I beat the shit out of both of them. I smack them. Not bad. I smack them around a little bit, knock them down, you know. And but now the girls are all upset. They take off, 
And then I pull into the hotel where I was staying at. And there's a guy named Jay Johnson. I think he's still around. He's a ventriloquist. And I said to him, I said, you know, um, I said, you're not going to believe what happened. These guys were following me. I, I told them I don't want them to come. They, now the two girls are gone, and I'm stuck here by myself. And he said, did you say Bonanno? I said, yeah. He goes, that's a big mob guy. I said, yeah, well, what the fuck? I mean, this is his grandkid or something, you know. He goes, ah, oh, man, you know, you got to watch that. These are like really, I said, I said he didn't, I, he wasn't mobbed out. He was like a, a college kid or something, you know. And as I'm talking to him, I see that fucking car behind me. Now, here goes my heart again, you know. I, they're like parked, looking at me with the lights on. So Jay goes in to his room and he goes, uh, I, I said, won't you go call the cops or something? You know, I don't know what to do here. So I get in my car and act like I reach underneath the seat, like I got a gun, you know. And I slowly pull up, and I'm ready to get out of there, you know. Uh, I didn't want to let them know I was staying there. I just wanted, I was in my car. And they're following behind me. I turn left to get out of there. I swear to God, it's a dead end. It's a brick wall. I said, holy fuck. Now, there's a thing going through me right now in my head saying, if they get out of that car... I'm going to back up my car and run over one of them or something. Because I figured they probably had a gun or something where they were going to try to fuck me up. Because I smacked them around a little bit, you know, embarrassed them, I think, you know. And I didn't know. Um, but I was waiting for them. They were waiting for me. And I sat in my car and I just stared at rear view mirrors. Come on. Get out on my side view mirrors. Just check and make sure no one's come up on the side. I'm going to back up. I'm going to run over them. I, I didn't know what to do, right? So the cops were coming, and they could hear the cops. I don't know if they, sometimes cops will just go by and you don't know, you know. But they backed up and got out of there. So the next day, I don't know how the fuck I got into this story about getting into Canada, but um, so the next day, the guy I was working for, named Bill Osco, he, uh, he produced Alice in Wonderland and Flesh Gordon, which made him a millionaire. They were uh, skin flicks. They were pornos in the 70s, but they were funny pornos. They were take off of pornos. The first one never do that. And it called Ellison Wonderland and Flesh Gordon, you know, and they were pornos. Anyways, so he, he said to me, he says, hey, man, uh, what happened last night? I said, ah, you yeah, know, these two guys and whatever, you know, just it's no big deal. It's, you know, smack around. And, you know, he goes, you know, you, you got you to gotta get out of town. Now, at, the, at that time, my friend Boom Boom Mancini was in town training for his first professional fight. Ray Boom Boom Mancini. Uh, he was out of Youngstown, where I used to fight out of, and my brother. Anyways, so, you know, I wanted to go see Ray again. He was training. And, um, you know, I said, Bill, I said, well, he said, we may got to get out of town. I mean, Ray's here. I want to hang out with him. He goes, no, 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 no. You're going to understand. Those guys you smacked around, they're going to uh, they're, 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 they're gonna be looking for you. The word's out already. I said, what the fuck that happened last night? He goes, let me tell you something. He says to me, the Bananos are one of the made big families. I said, so what's this guy going to do? He's going to go to his grandpa, like, oh, he, uh, you know, uh, grandpa, you know, this guy uh, smacked the shit out of me. He's going to look like an idiot. He goes, no, that's not what's going to happen. He's going to go to one of his lieutenants or one of the guys that works for the father, grandfather, <clears throat> and they're going to look for you and fuck you up. And either that or dump you in a fucking desert. So I said, I'm not leaving. I he said, you got to go, dude. You got to go. So, again, we didn't say do it, but, you know. So, I, it's like the next day I'm in my car, and I'm fucking leaving Tucson, you know. Kind of sucked, too, because there was a lot of comics that would come through, you know. Tom Dreesen, uh, you know, people you wouldn't know. Uh, George Miller, who's a really good friend, was good friends with Letterman, and he had died recently. And, a lot, you know, Red Fox, and yada, yada. You know, it's, it's, I get the chance to meet these guys. I didn't get their respect, because I was a horrible comic, you know, at the time. So I left. So I told my brother the story, my brother Ricky, the story. And so like two months later, he calls me up. He says, Bobby, because now I'm in, uh, at this time, I'm, I was living in California. 
I was in California. Yeah, I was in California, of course. It was uh, 82. And he says, uh, hey, man, uh, you got to turn on the TV because he's back east, so there's a three-hour difference. So he was watching 60 Minutes. And I said, what's going on? Because turn on 60 Minutes. Just when it comes on, you know, watch it. I turn it on, and they were doing one of those segments on 60 Minutes about the Bonanno family in Tucson, about how many bodies were dumped in the desert, and they're trying to get the grandfather and indict him on the Rico charge and also uh, for these killings and trying to tie him in and bring down the family. So, like, <laughs> I've never told anyone this story for many years. I mean, like, 20-some years because I figured, my God, what if, you know, like, I tell the story and it comes out, you know, I'm on the Howard Stern show or whatever, I tell the story, and this kid wants to be a big shot 20 years later and come back after me, you know, because I embarrassed him, you know, especially if I would talk about it on in the media or on the radio or something. Um, so that's that's fucked up. I mean, that's a crazy story in my life. So I'm like, my God, I could have been dumped in the desert, you know. And these, you know, uh, I, I mean, yeah, I'm driving back to California thinking, you know, fuck these guys, you know. But I didn't realize who they were, and they were for, they were for real, you know. Obviously, when I go to New York, when I leave uh, California at the time, I live in California now, but, uh, but when I went from 84 to 85, I, went, I left for uh, New York. And then after, you know, I got to work the clubs and get better, and that's when I really got to be a really good comic, um, I would work a lot of clubs where mob, mob owned, you know, and especially after Goodfellas, people loved me, so I would actually meet some of the real people that was in Goodfellas, the, the relatives of. Um, I was actually one time in, I was in Brooklyn, a place called Bay Ridge, right over uh, Verrazano Bridge in Brooklyn, and a guy named Frankie Blue. I swear to God, he owned this comedy club, and he used to pay me in hundreds all the time, right? Well, Goodfellas had just come out. Uh, my ADD got me jumping around, sorry, but so. Uh, so, um, Frankie uh, had his club, so we had a little comedy club, uh, and then downstairs was his, you know, his office. His office was bigger than a comedy club, by the way. So, Goodfellas had just come out, and Tommy D. Simone, who was uh, who Pesci played, was freaking nuts. I mean, he's fucking crazier than Pesci played him in that film. I mean, he would cut people up in pieces, and so. Anyways, so Frankie says to me, he says, hey, um, this is Frankie D. Simone's niece. She just came back from seeing Goodfellas. Goodfellas was in the theater at the time. He was in Goodfellas. This guy was in Goodfellas. Two niggas just stole my truck. Remember that part? That was him. And, I, and she, was hot. she was hot, too. And she goes, yeah, I just seen that film. I said, did you like it? They made us look like a bunch of bimbos, like we, as, as females, a bunch of bimbos. And, like, I'm going, yeah, I, yeah, I guess it wasn't, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, what am I supposed to say to her, right? You know, like, you know, Tommy D. Simone's niece, and, you know, I'm in this fucking mob joint. That's a comedy club. I go, yeah, yeah. And she made it look like a bunch of bimbos, a pooey on them, like she liked the fake spit, like pooey, poo, you know. And it, it reminded me of that scene where uh, Elaine Brocco was talking to, uh, uh, oh, my God, uh, you know, uh, you know, she was talking about how they they come in her house and they spit on their own floor. To come, you know, the, the Italian women they spit. You know, when the federal people come in, she because she was talking about she would just let uh, them come in and you know go through her house. But the, the, how the Italian women would spit on her own floor like the fake spit. And when this girl who's really fucking hot, you know, a pooey on them pooey. You know, she didn't really spit, but almost like that fake spit. I'm like, you know, kind of turned me on, right? But I had to kind of agree with her because I didn't, you know, what am I supposed to say? Like, no, I think it's a really good film. And I didn't know it was going to try to be a classic film like it is now, you know. So, anyways, so I got to get into Canada. I want to come up to Canada. Um, and, you know, if you want to check me out, I got a lot of videos. You go to Bob Golub, B O B G O L U B. And, uh, you know, I got a website, but that website's not up. You'll find clips and shit like that. You'll love the one arm piece. The one arm piece I open up with in my act is one of the, it's a great opening. It's one, I'll tell you, I guarantee it's one of the better openings you ever see. So uh, you can always hit me up on Bob Gollup. That's B O B G O L U B 54 at gmail.com. 
or you can always get through me through to me on my uh, website. Uh, exciting thing I will say before I get out of here, and I'll talk more about this later, is I just directed and produced and starred in this film called Killing Them. And it's based on a stand-up comic serial killer. Dude, I swear to God, it's off the fucking charts, man. Like, I, I whack, I kill these people that, uh, you know, that did, I feel as a serial killer, did me harm. My agent, my manager, club owner. If you're a comic, you'll love this, man. I kill this club owner, and I'm not going to tell you how. It's so fucking cool. And uh, But he's not, he don't kill kids and no rape women and stuff like that. He kills everyone you, you would want to kill. And it's not Dexter. Fuck Dexter. This guy would kill Dexter, okay? But it's called Killing Them. And there's a clip on YouTube, uh, K-I-L-L-I-N, apostrophe, E-M, Killing Them. So, uh, but so listen, hit me up. Uh, glad to do this podcast. Looking forward to it. And uh, I'll talk to you soon. <laughs> Thank you.